Okay, so in this problem, what we're going to do is we're going to solve a symmetric infinite square well. We already talked about what the infinite square well is for the case in which we have a square well going from 0 to some length L. And we, in, we found that we had an infinite set of solutions, each one with an eigenfunction of the system. So we would essentially just have different modes that were happening between those two uh, infinite potential walls. And now what we're going to do is we're going to try to investigate what happens when your square wall is, instead of being from 0 to L, it, we have it from minus A to A. So essentially it is going to be symmetric about our vertical axis here. So immediately what we notice is that we have the following boundary conditions. We know that because the potential extends to infinity in these two boundaries, we're going to have the wave function be zero. So the fun wave function is going to be zero all the way here, and then we might have something like this, and then it becomes zero again. So th there is no probability at all that the, the particle or the system will actually exist outside of this confined region here. So the first thing we're going to do is write the Schrodinger equation. So we start off with our term minus h squared over 2m. Now we're going to have the second derivative of the wave function. And now notice that the, the potential is essentially zero within the region in which this function is defined. So we're going to have a zero term here, so we don't write that. And then we write the energy times the wave function. So this looks very, very, in fact, this is the same equation we solved for the infinite square wheel here. But now the difference is that the, the boundary conditions have changed and we'll see that this actually has a very very interesting effect on how our system is going to behave now. So we start off by rearranging everything so we're going to write the equation in the following manner so let's have k squared times psi x equals to zero and we know that we made the substitution k squared equals to 2me over h bar squared so that's our substitution there. And all we do is we find the characteristic equation. So we have r squared plus k squared equals to zero, which implies that r is going to be plus or minus i k. And then this is going to lead to the following solution. So we know that the solution is going to look like this. We're going to have a times cosine of kx plus b times sine of kx. And as we find the constants a and b, all we need to do is apply the boundary conditions. So let's see what we find from this. So the boundary conditions are, the first one is going to be psi at minus a is equal to zero. So we're going to have the following. a cosine of k minus a. Well, when we have a minus inside the argument of cosine, that just becomes cosine again. Because we know that cosine is, uh, is an even function, so minus the argument or plus the argument gives us the same result. Sine is an odd function, so if we put a minus inside the argument, then that means that we have a minus outside. So we're going to have B sine Ka. Okay, we cannot really do much with this because we know this is going to be a number, this is going to be a number, and they're going to be non-zero. We expect them to be non-zero at least. So... Let's apply the second boundary condition and see if we get something more meaningful. So this is also going to be zero. And now the trick is that we're going to put a cosine ka and we're going to have plus b sine of ka. All right, so we didn't do much progress with this, but at least now we have two equations and two unknowns. So we should be able to solve for a and b. So the first thing we can do is we can add both equations together. So let's have minus a plus psi a and this is going to give us it should all be equal to zero so we're going to have 2a cosine of ka and the two sine terms are going to cancel out so we're left with this here now we know that a cannot be zero we don't want it to be zero because we're getting a, a trivial solution out of that so what we can assume is that the argument ka should be equal to some number that would always make cosine zero, so a series of integers. Now the most logical choice, so for cosine we know that this is the case when we have a and we have the following kind of relation. So we're going to have n plus half 
times pi. And the reason for that is that cosine is zero for half integer multiples of pi. So we can either write this as n over two times pi or as n plus half pi. It doesn't really matter, but you will see that it's better to write it this way because it will make it more consistent with our derivation for the sine term. All right, so this isn't really very enlightening, but we can actually do some rearranging here. So we can write k in terms of the other terms. So this would be pi over 2a. And notice what happens here. If we actually add this up, this is 2n plus 1 over 2, we take the 2 outside, and now we have this expression. If n is just an integer, so let's say 1, 2, 3, and so on, this number is always going to be an odd, it's going to be an odd number, right? So essentially, we can rewrite this as follows. We can rewrite k as pi over 2a times n, and it is restricted to the case in which n is an odd number, so 1, 3, 5, and so on. And you will see why we prefer to write it this way as opposed to this. Now we're going to do the same for sine. So we're going to essentially just subtract both equations. So we're going to have minus a minus psi of a equals to zero. So the cosine terms cancel out, and then we have minus 2b sine ka. Okay, so now we need to basically make the argument some multiple integer of pi to get sine equals to zero. So this is going to be just n pi, right? And then we can rearrange this to have k in terms of everything else. So that's going to be n pi over a. So that's what we're going to get. And we know that n is just going to be any integer. So it's going to be 1, 2, 3, and, and so on. But now notice what we can do, because it obviously doesn't make sense, k, k having two separate values. We want to have everything be the same value and be consistent with it. So how about we write this k as n pi over 2a, so that it looks exactly like this one, but now we only take the even integers of n, so basically 2, 4, 6, and so on. Because in essence, it doesn't really matter what we're taking, as long as we're taking some integer multiple of pi. So if we put 2 in here, cancel side with that, we have pi over a. That's a multiple integer of pi. Then if we put 4 over here, we're going to have to, uh, the same case, and so on and so on. So that's the idea. We have essentially defined k as having this exact value for both cases. But now each case depends on a different set of integer values. So this is where interesting things start to happen, because now when we are going to write our solution, and I'm just going to do it somewhere here, it's going to look a little bit different to what we found for the regular infinite square root problem. We are actually going to have the following. Psi of x is going to be equal to a piecewise function, and it is going to be conditional. So the first thing we're going to have is a set of values or constants a n times cosine, so times cosine of n pi x over 2a for the values n equals to 1, 3, 5, or essentially all the odd integers. And then we're going to have bn sine of n pi x over 2a for all the even integer values, so 2, 4, 6, 8, and so on. So depending on which integer value we choose, we're actually going to have either a cosine or a sine function, which is a really interesting thing that we don't notice in the, in the other problem that we started with. Now, we could do the following. We could say, okay, how do we find a n and b n? Well, it turns out that they're both normalization constants, so you can just essentially just find the inner product of psi with itself. And, you know, to make it 1, you just solve for a n or b n, and that gives you your normalization constants. So, how about we go about solving that, and let's say we solve for a n first. So, let me just clear the screen here. So, we're going to apply the same method of normalization we used previously. We're going to have our inner product, which is just an integral, from minus infinity to infinity. And now we're going to have a square n 
cosine squared of n pi x over 2a times the x and we know that the limits are just going to be minus a to a so this is going to be minus a to a of a n squared and now we can replace this expression by 1 over 2 1 plus cos cosine of 2 n pi x over 2 a the two cancel out so we are left with n pi x over a the x so now let's say the constants up so we're going to have a n squared over 2 now we integrate this and this is going to be x plus a over n pi sine of n pi x over a and this is going to go from minus a to plus a alright so now what do you think is going to happen here well we're gonna use the following argument if we put a in here it cancels out with that we're left with an integer multiple of pi so sine becomes zero if we put minus a that doesn't matter because we still have a multiple integer of pi so sine is zero so this term is going to be completely ignored in this case and we're gonna be left with the following we're gonna have a square n over 2 times a minus minus a so this becomes 2a so in the end we're gonna have a n squared times a okay and we know that the inner product needs to be equal to 1 so this whole thing needs to be equal to 1 so in the end we're gonna have a n squared a equals to 1 solve for a n and this will give you the following 1 over square root of a and you can apply the exact same logic to the second function and you will actually find that it gives you the same normalization constant and it makes sense because you want your wave function to have the same amplitude I mean it wouldn't make sense if this had a different amplitude because it needs to essentially just obey this essential property of normalization so bn is also going to be equal to 1 over square root of a so in the end you're just going to have the same thing here but the only thing that changes is you're going to have a cosine or a sine so i just want to show you this example because i think it's really interesting in terms of how different your answer can look simply by shifting the boundary conditions we, we essentially have the same boundary conditions but we shifted our problem now to be symmetric about the vertical axis and look we now have a set of solutions and each one depends on whether our integer n is an odd or an even number so this was a really interesting example and hopefully you can see that very very interesting phenomenon starts to occur when you change the boundary conditions around